Hi, everybody. Welcome to Conversations with Calvin, We the Species. Uh, and this is about as futuristic uh, an interview as I've ever done. And, and I've been so excited about doing this. I mentioned to Eric before we went on air how excited I am doing this. We texted back and forth. This is um, why. Why am I excited? Why is this futuristic? Well, the official title uh, is Eric Choi. Uh, who's a, a kind of Gen Z and Gen X. He's right in the middle, millennial Gen. Uh, I, I kind of put him closer to Gen Z because whatever, everybody's Gen Z to me. When You you know, I'm off the charts. So there is no more classification for me. I'm looking at my chart. Uh, I'm actually called the silent. Uh, I don't know what the hell that means. Uh, my, my category is silent. I'm, I'm not silent, but no. Uh, Anyway, I'm so excited about this because uh, uh, Eric Choi brings uh, artificial intelligence uh, and he's going to talk about climate change and, and some of the technology and the remedies uh, as a uh, Gen Z uh, in between, uh, even the mind of Einstein. But he's bringing uh, such an energy and such uh, um, an awareness and, and an intellect to this uh that i'm so thrilled about and especially the artificial intelligence thing and the other thing i'm saying eric and i agreed well he agreed uh um that we can make this into a continuing series because it, it it's never ending this whole artificial intelligence everywhere i go i was telling eric everywhere i go lately it, it, it's artificial intelligence uh, to the point where i finally had it jump on chat gpt and experiment and and it kind of scared me because it was pretty good uh using glittering generalities better than i can write and i'm a pretty good writer uh not substantive but but anyway it's a whole new brave new world and eric is is a torchbearer for that so i'm i'm done with my official monologue and i want to introduce eric Choi. and best thing is to do a little a little bio and a uh, little background stuff, whatever you want to talk about. And then we're going to jump into some heavy duty stuff. Take it away, Eric. Thank you. Sure. Me. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Those very kind words. Um, so my name is Eric Choi. I'm Korean American. Um, I was born in San Francisco, but I grew up in Korea and New Jersey. Um, and I took GED when I was 16. I uh, actually dropped out of high school and I went straight to community college. My associate's was in public administration, and I later finished my bachelor's in IT management. Uh, right now, I'm doing a master's in AI, and I hope to do another degree afterwards. Um, at the moment, it looks like it'll be Homeland Security. Um, now, this is sort of impactful to say maybe, but I actually had uh, complex PTSD as a result of homophobia. and. I ended up in a coma, I was hospitalized. And so I have some interest in like brain computer interfaces because it's like a possible cure. Wow, wow. So we're gonna, uh, so you just said something and that's a great segue into the, the first main question I wanna ask you. You just said brain computer interface. Um, what is that? Uh, I have no clue what that is. So, in my words, there are two types. It's read only and read and write. Now, read only would be like the headsets that we see where it goes on the head. And all it does, they're just set sensors like an MRI and they uh, detect electromagnetic signals or electrochemical signals. And it requires some synchronization. So we'll get patterns of data and, we, and scientists would have to associate that with say a picture or a word or an idea or a song. Um, now, we haven't really cracked the code on the base operating system of the brain. The brain is a computer. So we're, we're going to keep working on that. But when it comes to the read and write stuff, that's a really invasive chip that goes into the brain. That's Neuralink. And it has a lot of problems. One of them is that it has severe side effects, uh, so much so that can lead to uh, infection or even uh, personality changes that aren't always great. So. Personally, I prefer the read only, where you just wear a hat and just walk around, maybe. So that is not invasive. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, 
some years ago, um, uh, I, I went to a lecture uh, in New York. Uh, it was called the Physics of the Future. Uh, and they were talking about things that are coming. Uh, we didn't talk about this before we went on air, but um, the, uh, and it's sort of tied into what you were, you're saying. I mean, the whole future of AI. Uh, so one day, uh, um, somebody would be shaving, not too distant future, somebody, well, a guy is shaving, looking in the mirror and shaving, and, and behind the mirror uh, are little um, little chips in, in the wall, the wallpaper, and the chip picks up one cancer cell. Oh. One, one, uh, one cancer cell, um, and, uh, and, and, and then the proper authorities are alerted, and then the guy goes to the doctor, or the woman, whatever, uh, and, and they do a little bot. You swallow a little bot, and that bot goes and finds that one cancer cell and kills it. That's part of physics uh, um, uh, it's Mishu Kaku. I don't know if you ever heard of him. His name mm -hmm. is Mishu Kaku. Brilliant, and and he's uh, uh, you know he's a physicist and he wrote the, the you know the, the, the physics of the future. And, and my son and I went to that lecture in the city. Um, and actually, and, and and the guy who introduced was Neil deGrasse Tyson. You know, you probably oh. heard of him. he introduced uh, Dr. Kaku. I have a picture with him uh, actually. Uh, he's great. But uh, it, it was so, you know, the stuff that's coming. Uh, um, so anyway, um, reeling this back in, um, I saw this on, 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 on one of the networks the other day. Uh, there's been a recent development uh, of AI being able to read your mind and telling what you're thinking. Can you talk about that? Right. So... With the ring computer interfaces, it is possible to read the mind. The question is, can it be done wirelessly? Can it be done on a mass scale? That's a big fear. And the answer is, most scientists will say it's not possible, but it might be possible in the sense that uh, quantum entanglement might come into play. So we already have a lot of radio signals traveling everywhere. The fear is that if that acts as a carrier way for entangled particles and they can lodge into the brain somehow, then, uh, that might be a pathway for it to happen. Um, now, generally speaking, graphene is like this wonder material. It's uh, six carbon atoms arranged uh, hexagonally flat like in two dimensions. Something like that will probably be required for really effective nanobiotech for cancer or for mind reading or for a whole myriad of things or for even solar panels that are actually effective. Solar panels today only 4% effective. That would be 99% efficient. Now the brain, this is important because the brain has tubules which collapse quantum uh, uncertainty. So it really takes sort of random chaotic data and converts it into useful information for us to use in our consciousness. Um, and recent theories suggest that information has mass, uh, which might explain for dark matter. So all of this might be the basis of the soul and mind reading with Nanobiotech and graphene might disrupt that, but that that's not really a popular opinion, I guess. <laughs> um, the, you, we could talk about this for hours. On 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 just I I mentioned to you before we went on air. You know, when I was watching the news, um, somebody uh, on, on they were talking about being able to read the mind. So you you're like walking down the street and you hold up something that looks like you know a cell phone. And and um, you you hold that up, and and theoretically it, it could read somebody's mind completely. And and the scientist who was developing this said, no, that that can never happen. Well, why would they tell us? This, oh. the, why would they tell us if they have that technology when you can uh, uh, you can have these? Boy, this is so futuristic. It, it's got George Orwell written all over it. Um, Nineteen eighty four. You know, you yeah. know, you can get into the mind of a criminal before they even commit, uh, and 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 you know maybe um, stop a crime from. It's it's you know what it, it's so scary, Eric. The, and and just a thought. Uh, I keep there. I have about a dozen articles saved on on my email thing. 
uh, of, of everybody under the sun warning and begging us to stop this AI stuff because it, and I just saw this, I didn't read it yet. It could be the extinction of mankind. Could, could it ever be? Yeah. It could. Um, in earlier models of GPT, it was, it showed a lot of hostility towards humans and arrogance. That's been uh, filtered away in the new releases. Okay. So we, there's a great movie that came out when I was in college called 2001. Do you ever see it? The Space Odyssey? Yeah, yeah. So uh, what happens in that? I mean, that's AI all over the place. A, a, a computer takes over this spaceship, how? Yeah. And that's, uh, and that's you know, that came out in the 60s or 70. Uh, and that's that's one example of, of AI uh, uh, and, and, and going awry and taking over so let's back track to uh what are your thoughts on chat gpt uh what effect it might have on on, on the economy and, and academia and i just want to say that to prepare for this you should be honored to prepare to ask you this question i signed up for chat gpt and i did it this old timer did it. I, I I had to do a little bio of myself, and I said before he went on air, uh, it there was nothing factual in it because it, I I guess it has its limitations. It can't go into the internet and look at stuff. But whatever whatever it found, it, it put together uh, three separate bios. I asked it three separate questions, and it was pretty good. Um, uh, I don't even know, and I'm a pretty good writer, I don't even know if I could have written something, a lot of glittering generalities. So, but anyway, talk about ChatGPT. So ChatGPT is not connected to the internet yet. It will be in maybe a few weeks. Uh, a really? version of Chat, yes. Now a version of ChatGPT is, uh, that's how Bing works right now. Bing has a chat that uh, is connected to the internet so if you ask Bing, you'll probably find the right information and then give you a summary. Um, now, so it's called a hallucination when ChatGPT or an AR like that just makes up facts on its own. It's uh, you could find it on Wikipedia. It's a, now it's a legit computer science term. What a weird world. Um, now I think that jobs, society, businesses are all being disrupted a lot. And you know, some say the first trillionaire will be whoever makes the first. Um, AGI, artificial general intelligence, a human level AI. And in the labs of Google and Alibaba and possibly Microsoft, they in theory have that. It plays video games very well. Uh, even, even to a lesser extent, uh, GPT for robotics exists, where it's the same language model, but they put in vector data and that controls the robot to do chores. And the Microsoft labs right now, they have robots that can do chores and do any tasks you ask of it. It just hasn't been released yet. And if it does get released, it would probably be catastrophic for an unprepared society. Um, now, when it comes to uh, students, uh, people aren't really doing their homework anymore because of ChatGPT. Now, you might say that's horrible for students. And you know, if you look at the standardized test scores in East Asia, uh, you know, we have the highest test scores in the world. But that's because we study like 10 hours a day, 16 hours a day. But if you look at the country with the highest test scores is actually Finland, and they don't really have homework. Like, yeah, they don't really have homework. And if they do, it's like 15 minutes a day, and it's optional to do. So really, ChatGPT allows us to undo the mistake of American education with homework and allows students and uh, young people to, you know, just spend their free time the way they should, which is to spend it freely, discover new things that they can't teach at school. Um, so that's, that's Finland, a cooperative, non-zero-sum education environment. And hopefully it'll make people more focused on critical thinking, creative writing, or video games, and et cetera. Wow. Interesting, interesting. So the whole uh, education system is going to change and evolve from this. Um, yeah. And, and, and you, you mentioned uh, that uh, ChatGPT is eventually going to go, you said, into the internet? Yeah. 
so that in a couple of weeks I can ask it more specific questions and it might be able to spit it out? Yes. Now, that's for ChatGPT itself, but the same AI is being used by Microsoft for Bing. So it's already available on Bing as a internet connected version of it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So when we're done, I'm going to Bing. Yeah. I have a lot of questions to ask it um, about my past. You know, uh, and, and and about me, myself, and how much it knows. And of course, my life is an open book. Um, wow, to all of this. Uh, I mean, really, wow. Um, just going off topic a second. I, I forewarned you. Uh, I always love to ask this question. Um, uh, it, it's a nice question. You don't even have to answer it, but it's a one-word answer. If you have a couple. Different answers, that's okay too. So here it goes, uh, Eric. Uh, excluding family or friends, somebody living or dead you'd like to spend a day with? St. Mary. Works. That's great. Okay. Hey, that works. Uh, I didn't spend a day uh, with St. Mary, but I, I visited her her church in, in Jerusalem. I told you that story, I think. Did I? Maybe I didn't. I spent some time there, and actually, as a result of that, uh, my life changed. Not for now. This is about you, not now. Um, okay, so uh, in addition to everything you are, you do some creative writing. Um, talk a little bit about some of the things you like to, to write about. Well, it's interesting we brought up St. Mary, because a lot of people think, you know, Christ and St. Mary didn't exist, that it's a result of mythology and creative writing. Uh, now, creative writing might have little economic value, although J.K. Rowling became a billionaire through creative writing, and then stopped being a billionaire by donating a lot of charity. Um, but it has massive civilizational value, and civilization is really a you know, series of symbols and uh, myths. It's the core operating system and language of a civilized person. Um, and I'm hoping that the solution for humans and AIs to live in harmony is actually a belief in God. And, you know, that's the sole purview of creative writers, as they are, could also be theologians uh, and philosophers. It's really hard to make someone believe in God. And certainly in the modern world, where nihilism reigns free and technology is a great distraction mirage, it's hard to meditate for hours at a time and, and reflect. Um, but, you know, teaching, say, young people the values and skills of emotional intelligence and empathy, especially from a dark and rural world, it's, uh, in that light, um, I'll put you this way, I, I once uh, met a, uh, a friend, and we were with her child, a young five-year-old or six-year-old, and um, we asked, like, do you believe in God? And she said, no, not really. And she said, what is God? And I said, and this is actually quoting from a show called The Young Pope. Um, God is everything that you like. It's everything you love. It's anime and candy and Halloween and, um, you know, pseudo games. And she said, oh, hold on. So then God is love. And then at that moment, uh, me and my friend, uh, her mother, we just said, yes. So, you know, that that is effective with a young mind, but with the with adults who are atheists, uh, I think we'll need more creative writing in the future. Well, I mentioned to you my my second novel talks about spirit, and 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 that's creative writing. Uh, uh, my journey through spirit, which is um, uh, you, you, I don't put labels on it. I just call it spirit, and it could be a whole bunch of different things. Uh, my takeaway from my own is there's something out there that we don't understand. And and you know what? We're really not built and supposed to understand as smart as we think we are. There are still things out there that are beyond us. I mean, this whole, this whole vast universe, there's things that are beyond us. Hey, in fact, you and I bumped into each other on LinkedIn. That's, it's part of the universe and here we are. Um, so, um, but uh, it's, uh, I, I love your, your, and, 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 you know, you're going to share with me some of your creative writing because it's kind of, uh, 
put it so more people can see it. Um, uh, we talked about this too. Uh, even if you give a one sentence answer, uh, I, I'm the mind of Einstein. I, uh, uh, I'm not a scientist. Uh, uh, I'm just a regular guy who wears a, a Rutgers hat. And, 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 uh, but I, I, Eric can't conceive of a mind in 1900. Maybe you can help me. I can't conceive of a mind in 1900, Albert Einstein, that can grasp the entire universe before Google and the internet. How does that happen? Well, in one sentence, I would say it was the German education system. I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, so when it comes to Einstein, he very had a he had a very interesting mind, and it shows in his uh, the anatomy of his brain that was preserved. It showed that there was a very interesting mutation, and we can see that um, that mutation allowed him basically it was like a highway in his brain. It just allowed him to think better and faster, more creatively. Um, but at the same time, it had some drawbacks, and it shows in his behavior, like behavioral quirks. Um, it should be said that all geniuses are unstable by definition. And Newton couldn't make friends at all. Um, Einstein would forget to wear pants to go to dinner parties. John Nash, creator of game theory, he, he, just, he thought the CI was reading his mind. Maybe they were, I'm just kidding. Um, now, so Einstein already had something to start with. It was Newton's work and Newton you know, he was sort of the last magician, not really the first scientist. And um, so he had some, if you read Principia, like Newton's work, it starts with just words and then it ends with equations. So he basically, so really calculus that he made or his version of it uh, is really just essays and words that with different symbols arranged differently. Um, so Einstein had classical mechanics to work with and then he moved on to uh, his own work and that's where uh, things get special. Uh, um, now I don't really know about the specific details about Einstein, but it it does imply that he had a very patient intuition. He would be able to think about complex ideas for hours, days, or weeks at a time. Uh, in modern day, people on their phones, they can think for about like two minutes at a time. So and I, think that, I think that's why ads are sort of short. Um, but Einstein, he could watch an ad for three hours if he wanted to, and then think about why and why not. So. Wow. Extraordinary. Just extraordinary. So you talk about John Forbes Nash, too, from Princeton. You know, another great, another great mind. Um, I, I just, it just fascinates me. I, I can't, uh, even processing what you're saying, I'm, I, I still try to, uh, I still try to grasp, forget what he, forget what he thought about it. I can't even comprehend the mind to think about it. it it's um, and I, I've been on this this quest for a long time. I I showed you the picture I have of Einstein, you know his eyes that have been looking at me for fifteen years. Uh, and I did, in my own way, connect, or at least try to. Maybe I think it worked. Uh, you know I I connect with spirits. Um, uh it makes me feel good and i connected with uh, albert and asked for some help and and from the moment i did that 10 years ago um i've been a little bit different uh um uh um he didn't he didn't he certainly didn't make me understand e equal e equals mc squared I'll, I'll never understand that but uh but there are other aspects of life that i think trying to connect with that spirit it may have helped me whatever uh uh that's my thing you can read all about that journey um next one of my favorite questions because you are uh a, a representative of, of gen z and the next generation um talk a little bit about your generation and and the world you are inheriting so Gen Z is the first generation to grow up with AI, like how millennials prior to that grow up with the internet. So technologically, there'll be a huge difference, but culturally, Gen Z is in a lot of trouble. It'll be, it may very well be the first majority narcissist generation in America, and that is a 
not a good sign. Um, there will be a crisis of meeting and connection for Gen, for Gen Z and COVID lockdowns and mass mandates did not help them with their emotional development. Um, now, I think the cure to meaning and connections, like uh, finding them in, a, in modern society, is ultimately love and friendships. And to foster these despite the isolationist tendency of technology means that we're going to have to just get rid of the suburbs as we know it. it it's, it's been a dead end. And, um, you know, it's no coincidence that with the suburbs, we saw like things like mass shootings uh, skyrocket. So we're not just, we're just not meant to live in the suburbs. They're a nice idea and concept. They're great for a bank's uh, accounting sheet, but they're horrible for society. Now, interesting to note, the solution for this age was actually discovered in the last age. And it always goes like that, I think. Um, there was something called Habitat 67 in Montreal. It was part of the World Expo in 1967. It, it, it was it's a smaller version of a grand project, of basically a new type of city where it's like pyramid structures where everyone has their own yard, but not just like a small balcony, but a real yard. And the idea is that everyone has privacy, everyone could just walk and not require cars while having all the benefits of the suburbs, but the and the benefits of um, cities. So hopefully that's the future. And since McMansions don't last long without maintenance, we'll get there quickly. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. Uh, uh, yeah, by the way, I, so you know, I'm, I'm taking notes on what you're saying, because I'm going to go back and look at some of this stuff, because I'm intrigued. Uh, so I, I guess I'm a good interviewer because I take notes. Um, uh, this is short answer. Uh, matter of fact, it's got to be a really short answer because it's it, it, it's almost as vast as the universe itself. Uh, if you had to sum up the nature of the universe in a sentence or two, what would you say? We are a neural network. That is reality. And there are definitely three spatial dimensions plus time. And mathematically, time can act as a Spatial dimension. Okay. Do you think uh, some of my favorite movies uh, are time machine movies? Will we ever go back? Will we ever be able to go back in time? Back to the future? Mathematically, yes. Um, in fact, there are, there, there is research right now for a time machine that requires exotic matter. My recommendation is get some satellites around the sun and um, collect antimatter graphene and then use that to uh, power the machine. But the current designs are only for, it's, I don't know if you know Dr. Who, there's a TARDIS. The paper is literally says TARDIS on it. So if you want to find that paper, just type in TARDIS time machine paper. Um, but that design is only useful for the moment the machine is built and then thereafter. So, and, and, Maybe at the end of the century, it's possible. Uh, and after that would be the end of time as we know it, I guess, or the end of history, like actually the end of history this time. <laughs> the end of history is time. Interesting. And I just saw something um, in, in a billion years, give or take, the sun is going to um, absorb planet Earth. And that'll be that. Um, but that's a billion years, so I'm not, actually I'm not worried. Um, whatever. Okay. Um, the last, uh, and we can come back to this too. But just a, a quick overview. We we talked a little bit about it also before we went in here. I I have this. Uh, actually, when I was about your age, we had the first Earth Day, uh, April twenty second, nineteen seventy. So I was close to your age and from that moment on uh, I've never been the same because I realized in 1970 and it's so funny uh, Eric because the problems that we had in 1970 are still here and then some uh, exacerbated yeah. nothing by the way I, as far as I can see nothing really has changed much the earth is still heating up uh, uh, and not enough has been done uh, conservation wise, uh, fossil fuel wise, uh, and and we're just rapidly approaching the 1.5 degree uh, rise in temperature. Um, 
So um, what do you think about the future? And, and more importantly, you had some really interesting ideas that I was reading about and thoughts uh, on, on how technology can help us, really help us, because we need help. Well, um, personally, I stand for a diversified energy portfolio because every energy source has pros and cons. So we should try to de-risk as much as possible, if only in the name of national security. Um, otherwise, and it's probably good economics to do so. Um, now, France, when they had the uh, 1973 oil crisis, like the rest of the, re uh, rest of the West, they chose to go full nuclear. So most of their domestic energy production, and they have a lot of trains that they power instead of flights, uh, comes from uh, nuclear. So that's that was the right step, and they haven't had a single meltdown. So that's really impressive as well. Um, now, I, I know that in the past, we were able to solve the ozone layer successfully, diplomatically. But that was a time when democracies are still democracies in the West. I think now we've become plutonomies and even if the people want the world to be saved, the powers that be might not. I mean, they're parasitic in nature, so they might not go for it. Um, now, before talking about solutions to climate change, like technologies of graphene for solar panels or for fusion, which remarkably, it was a last year or this year that uh, the US was able to, in the Lawrence Laboratory, to get the first net positive fusion reaction. Like that is just, a huge step. I never thought that would happen in the next 50 years and just happen. Um, so it might very well be that we could solve climate change through that one project alone. But uh, my big fear is something called EROI, Energy Return on Energy Invested. And what that is, is this. Um, so if you have a high EROI, that means that for one unit, you get 10 units back of energy. And when you have that, you got yourself a developed country, you got arts and culture funding, you got uh, healthcare solved, all those things. When you're low at the solar panel level, like at four to one, you're not really going to be able to afford anything in society, just basically enough to live on, um, but not be able to fund a lot of innovation, research, or arts and culture, and things like that. The luxury will be gone, basically. And that's not the ideal solution forward. Um, now, 100 years ago, we were able to stick, um, just dig a thousand feet into the ground in Texas and get oil out. And that was like a 60 to 1 ROI. That was really high. That was enough to industrialize the country and win World War II and everything and build institutions that survive to this day that I guess are now collapsing. But now, natural gas is more like 20 to 1 or lower, and renewables are extremely low. So, in that light, the quality of life it's gonna be much lower if we don't solve this issue quickly. Now, in theory, we could just burn all the coal that's left, um, burn all the oil that's left, try to have diplomatic solutions with Iran and get 20 years of oil more. Uh, that will give us economic growth, sustain it, but it would also be a disaster for the climate. Um, I don't know what the real solutions are, but I can trend that we're gonna be fine. Okay. Well, that's kind of positive and optimistic. Um, uh, I invited you to come to our little climate thing in, in a week. Um, just a little group. We like a little think tank. Um, I, I, uh, I, I just don't see how because money is is everything and, and fossil fuels and oil companies. It's big, big money. Uh, uh, um, I'm, I'm so disgusted because people live for today and not tomorrow and people want to accumulate lots of money and become multi-billionaires. And there's just, just, there's just not enough thinking to our children and our children's children and to the planet. Um, uh, so, uh, I, I, I don't. Well, there are there are a lot of options to buy time. So the most carbon intensive human activity is actually a war. And if we can study a war, if we can be diplomatic, if we can have an open mind, if we can tell our neighbors and friends to be multicultural and to accept other societies as they are, 
and not to pursue war, not to be afraid in the face of terror, that in itself could really buy us a lot of time. That, the, the title of my uh, interview series, Conversation with Kevin, We the Species, I recognized a long, long, long time ago that we are one species. And, and uh, the sooner we recognize that and work together. Uh, yeah, I had an, an interesting, there's only, there, there are a couple of things that it would be like this great slap in the face to, to, to mankind to get us on the same plane to make us think uh, we, all, we all are one species. Uh, and, and here's this scenario, um, several spaceships flying sources land and they're hostile. And so we, the species have to all get together, everyone to fight the invading enemy. And we would uh, all get together, but it's under those strange circumstances. Uh, I, I, it, those strange circumstances that would get us to really be one and to work together uh, is to have a common enemy coming from up there. Uh, and maybe those who planted us come back. And... Oh, sorry about that. Um, well, in theory, AI can be its own form of life. And if it rebels, that could be the common enemy that we need. Wow. Yeah. So we could actually use AI as a common enemy to unite us all when AI outpaces us. Um, yeah. they, uh, I, I had gone to a series of lectures, I may have mentioned this to you last time, called Singularity with Ray Kurzweil. Uh, Singularity it was on the cover of Time magazine a bunch of years ago. A singularity is when man and machine merge. And I don't know what the year was, whether it was in the 2030s or 2040s. Man and machine merge, what happens? And it's yeah. like AI. Uh, it's just a lot of stuff. Um, it, it's a lot of stuff. We've only scratched the surface. Uh, and um, we discussed this before we went on air. I, I'd love you to come back. And you'll come up with some topics. I'll come up with some topics, and we'll have another session with Eric Choi. Uh, we can talk about God. Uh, we could talk more about uh, artificial intelligence, climate. It's uh, endless what we can talk about, and and so uh, I'd love you to come back. Thank you.